You know, a lot of times these days, we think that we have to generate leads through paid ads. And we say, hey, let's just throw some money at it. Let's generate some leads. Let's bring all that in. That's not always the best way to do it. I had Sven Radovic on. He's fantastic with growth. He's really smart around it. He's been in all sorts of different roles within the startup world. And he was able to share some other great ways you can generate leads that don't cost you any money. So take a look at that. I think you're really going to like this episode and then see if you can apply what Sven recommends. Welcome to Sastery in the Making, the podcast that features the people who made the software world what it is today and the leaders who are shaping the future of technology. Here's your host, Matt Wallach. Yes, welcome. I am Matt. Welcome, welcome to Sastery in the Making. Really excited to have you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. By the way, if you are not subscribed yet, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Lots of great guests and innovators coming up soon, so you're going to want to make sure you do not miss out on that. And I'm really delighted about today's show. Really looking forward to it. I hope you are as well. I've got Sven Radovics with me. Sven, how you doing? Doing great, Matt. How you doing? I'm doing great as well. Really excited. Sven is live from Singapore right now. Really cool. We've got technology that connects us all the way around the world. But Sven, let me tell everybody about you. Guys, Sven knows his stuff. Sven, he's the founder at Intribe. And really, the Intribe partnership marketing platform helps companies expand their reach and lower their customer acquisition costs through partnership and cause marketing. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. He's also formerly the SVP of sales at International at Opkicks, if I said that right, Opkicks. But when it comes to growth, when it comes to knowing how to make things happen and get ahead and drive revenue, Sven is the man. So Sven, once again, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Likewise. Well, tell me what's been going on with you lately and what's coming up? Uh, look, I mean, the timing for this, uh, this podcast, uh, or this chat, uh, couldn't be better. Uh, we've just kicked off our pre-seed round, uh, and we're preparing to launch out of beta next month. Uh, we've got Chinese New Year coming up, which is uh, probably delayed it a little from my last investor update, but uh, you know, really couldn't be a more exciting time uh, in the development of Intribe. So tell us, what exactly does Intribe do, and, and who are you serving? There, there are two ways that you can think of Intribe, really. Uh, uh, you know, what really sticks with people is when I say it's Tinder for brand partnerships, but probably a more accurate description is like a linked, uh, a niche version of LinkedIn, uh, but specifically focused on partnerships uh, between brands uh, without all the spam. Uh, and so the target market for LinkedIn uh, really is small to medium enterprises. Uh, the sweet spot would be, uh, you know, a small growing company uh, that has a marketing manager, maybe one or two people on their marketing team, but doesn't have a dedicated partnerships marketing manager. Uh, and the other target market is startups. Uh, so startups that, uh, you know, particularly uh, bootstrapped uh, or early stage uh, that really need to make every dollar count, uh, they can get a lot more out of brand partnerships than they can out of paid, paid advertising, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So I love what you mentioned with startups. That's something that I'm very passionate about. And many of you who are listening know that I work directly with startups and help them understand how they can grow. But you yourself, you've been in all sorts of roles around startups. I mean, I love your story. Sales engineer, an early executive on the advisory board of some, an angel investor, and now a founder. So what do you love so much about the startup world? You know... There's so much to love. Uh, I think the best way that I can describe it uh, was something that happened to me a few years ago. So my very first startup was WatchGuard Technologies. Uh, I was one of the first two people in Asia, in the Asia Pacific region. It's where I was a sales engineer. I was sort of crossing over from hardcore tech, techie to into sales and business development. Uh, and I didn't realize it until I went back to visit some old colleagues that were still there. So WatchGuard was a, was a pre-first tech boom company, uh, you know, rode the wave and then, you know, rode the crash, survived the big crash, uh, and is still around. Uh, and so I had the opportunity to visit them about a decade after I left there. And 
what completely blew me away and, and really, you know, is the best summary of everything that I like about startups uh, is that I was walking around the office, I was meeting some of the new people, and I could still see processes in place that I had created from halfway across the other side of the world as a young sales engineer that knew nothing about business, but there were problems that needed to be fixed. We needed to get things done. And, you know, that still existed a decade after I'd left. And oh. no, you can't do that in a big corporate. You can't do that in any other industry that I know of as somebody that is young and experienced, but just needs to get the job done. You know, you can have a lasting impact on a brand. And, and you know, that's really, that summarizes in one story of what I love about startups. I love that same exact thing. That's really uh, resonating with me because when I came out of college, I worked for a big global brand, a hospitality company. And, you know, I was a lowly manager right out of college. And if I had a great day or if I had a bad day, it didn't really impact the company one way or another. And, you know, I learned a lot in that experience for sure. But I came to realize I want to have an impact. And so yeah. From then, I've been in startups, and I love that you said that there's processes that you put in place a decade ago are still being used because I've seen the same thing with my startups yeah. that are still around. It's so cool to go back and see that they're still following some of the same things that you incorporated, that you did. And above that, not just those processes, but if you have a great day in a startup, it can make a difference in the trajectory yeah. of that company. Yeah, you can really move the needle. And and again, you know, nowhere else. So yeah, absolutely on the same page there. That's fantastic. So that's a lot of different roles and, and, and views of a startup. Have all these roles and ways that you've been working with startups, have they made you better and how? Look, so many different ways. Uh, I mean, that's a great question. It's, you know, what, what to, how to answer. So... The, the sales engineering role is where it all started. Uh, and because we were such a small team, uh, and, you know, we're talking late 90s here. So, you know, there no smartphones, no messenger. You know, I couldn't walk into a, into a, a restaurant in Japan, in Tokyo, and ask for directions. There was no translator app, no Google Maps. You know, none of that existed. So, you know, right from the get-go, it wasn't necessarily being a sales engineer. Uh, that, uh, you know, really taught me about just how to make things happen, uh, when you're under resource, but just being in that position of being early on the ground, first in region. So learn a ton from that. You know, we local partners in Australia wanted a certification course on firewalls. Uh, you know, corporate didn't have one. So we created our own locally in region. Uh, so there was a lot of that sort of thing that went on. Uh, the other thing, that had taught me was, you know, still dial up internet. So I'd be in some random hotel in, in Taipei or, or in Jakarta and, you know, couldn't get an internet connection for days. So I was completely disconnected uh, from day-to-day -day advice or guidance. Uh, and so again, you know, really learned to think on my feet and, and, and you know, make decisions. Uh, so, you know, from that role, there was just a ton that I learned. And that was probably the biggest acceleration in, in my career and personal development all in one. Uh, but every other role that I had really gave me different perspectives. So I, I can remember being a young, safe engineer, you know, feeling a little unsafe in the working environment. You know, as a new immigrant, first generation Australian, family was immigrants from war-torn regions in Europe. Uh, very working class, you know, fell into technology just because I loved it and, and fell into startups by accident. And, you know, really looked back at corporate uh, as and, and the people at corporate, the executives as some sort of super smart, uh, you know, highly intelligent, highly experienced people that, that, you know, wouldn't be interested in what I had to say. And so, you know, A, there was the typical, I guess, career progression, but then bouncing around between different roles, having a sales leadership view, having a marketing leadership view, uh, you know, really uh, got me to understand both sides of, you know, what I see as the same coin, you know, in a lot of companies, there's a lot of tension between sales and marketing. Uh, I think that's getting better these days, 
but certainly in the 90s, early 2000s, you know, they were often very different people and looked at each other like aliens. Uh, having the advisory role and then coming back and being a founder now myself it was a really interesting learning process. Uh, you know, it's really easy to give advice, not a lot of great advice to give and, and uh, a lot of um, experience to share in different startups. And then, you know, suddenly I'm a founder for six months. And I see myself making a lot of the exact same mistakes I coach other founders not to. And, you know, that's really completing the picture. It's this kind of been lucky enough to develop this 360 degree view, you know, having done a couple of angel investments as well. And now I'm in a, in a pre-seed round. That certainly helps with the communication. And when angels are asking certain questions or potential investors are asking questions, I'm like, yeah, I know where that comes from. So I feel yeah. very lucky. I actually feel really, really fortunate in the way my career has unfolded. Well, I mean, absolutely. It's so well-rounded. It's it's hitting from a lot of different aspects that, of course, you're going to have a great understanding of all the different pieces coming together within a startup. So I love that you mentioned the the sales and the marketing teams. That, you know, in many cases, they're at odds and they're kind of fighting against each other. And that's very common. Marketing feels like, hey, they're driving a lot of leads, but sales isn't closing them. Sales feels like the marketing leads aren't very good. So how do you think sales and marketing should be working together so that they can be better off and that the company overall can be better off? Look, I think a lot of it starts with culture. Uh, you know, a lot of things, particularly in startups, uh, really start with culture and the, the founding team. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a number of things that, uh, that I've been thinking about as I've been thinking about this interview, and I might uh, circle back to some of it later. But first, understanding that it, we're all people. You know, the, 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 we're all humans. We all have stuff going on in our lives. Uh, we all have, um, you know, different stresses day to day that we, you know, we try not to bring into the work environment we do. So, you know, simply uh, being a little more empathetic, which I can tell you as a, as a sort of mid to late 20 something engineer at a, at a really cool tech startup at the time, I wasn't. Uh, so, you know, getting to understand the people, I think sales and marketing really need to be, you know, if we're still talking about the office experience, uh, they need to be in the same room. You know, they need to be on the same floor. I've seen, you know, in, as, as, you know, WatchGuard Technologies got a lot bigger, you know, marketing was on one floor, sales was on a different floor. You know, that to me, you know, really when I said two sides of the same coin, that's what I think it is. So I think really integrating it and, and then, uh, learning about each other's metrics and, and, and the challenges that both sides have and, and really coming together and, and looking at, looking at what the goals are for the company and then working together at defining the, the monthly, weekly, quarterly metrics as a team, you know, almost as one team, uh, just one team with two people doing, you know, different people doing different tasks to get to the same goal. Yeah, I agree. I think that's what it's all about, making sure they're coming together, make sure that the goals are aligned. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times marketing has a goal of number of leads. Well, that doesn't really help sales because some of those leads could be garbage. Yeah. And so really making sure the the goals are aligned, like you mentioned, is gold. I think that's awesome. So thank you for for clarifying that and sharing that. So thinking of of growing and leads and all that, a lot of people these days they're really focused on paid ads. But in your mind, is that actually the most effective method for generating some leads? Oh uh, look, I'm really glad you asked that because uh I I really don't think it is today. I understand, you know, why we think like we think, why you know, why this has been the case. Because I, I remember Google AdWords right in the beginning when when they launched. It's been around for a long time, and I think you know, there's probably a lot of founders that have grown up just thinking it's it's always been like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the beginning, when when paid ads came in. Uh, and I remember reading about it and attending, you know, some seminars and, 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 uh, watching some videos. It seemed like magic. You know, you could, you could dial it in to the nth degree, uh, really, you know, hyper target, uh, your audience like it was never available before. And then you could track them to the nth degree. You could see, you know, how often they came to your website. You know, they opened your emails. 
uh, and and it was really inexpensive. Uh, and the best thing about it was, and and I remember having this conversation, and, and you know, I think my my eyes were as big as dinner plates. You know, I was just stunned by how cool this was. Was that you know you could you could split test uh, almost infinitely, uh, and the Google algorithm or, or a bit you know the Facebook algorithm uh, would figure out which version was the most popular and then just present that more and more often. So you didn't need to have the creative solution, you know, immediately uh, out of the gate. You know, you didn't need to pay, you know, tens of thousands on copywriters to start with. You could let, you know, I guess the wisdom of the crowds was a big thing, but, you know, the algorithm would figure it out. You press go, it was super inexpensive and, and magic happened. You know, you got leads, you got business, and then you could tweak it. Uh, and I think, you know, although people don't necessarily think of it as magic anymore, uh, the, the early positioning was so strong and so powerful that, you know, right across all in industries, but certainly in startup industries, uh, you know, create a landing page, uh, and then just do some paid ads to drive some traffic, uh, and see if anybody clicks on buy before you build a product. Great strategy to, to test the market, of course. Um, before you build, but paid advertising isn't just isn't as expensive as it used to be. Uh, and so what we're seeing, uh, is it's been, uh, it's been a slow, a slow journey that I see accelerating. So over time, it's certainly gotten more expensive. You know, if you're in a competitive area, uh, and you're competing for really popular keywords, uh, you're, you know, you're paying a lot for that. Uh, but sure. over the last, since the pandemic, that's really accelerated. Uh, 2020 over 2019, the cost of Facebook advertising, uh, increased by 89%. Uh, and then in 2021, Q2 over Q1 was another 39% increase in the cost of ads. Now, at the same time, the returns, uh, are, you know, not quite falling off a cliff, but certainly getting a lot harder to achieve. Uh, and so, you, and that's because of a number of things. You have uh, Apple with iOS 14 mm -hmm. started blocking things uh, by default. That was first. Uh, I remember iOS 15, and I actually have this uh, in my pitch deck, just the first screen when you do the upgrade or you, you, know, you install a new phone. Uh, it's just a, a big question. And, you know, the first thing is, you know, block all tracking by default, and it's already pre-selected for you. Uh, mm. You have GDPR in Europe, and Europe keeps tightening things. Um, Google's been talking about uh, blocking third-party tracking cookies. Uh, and then as, as of last week, uh, really timely for this conversation, of course, in the U.S., uh, the Democrats proposed a new bill uh, to, to block all the stealth tracking that's going on, uh, wow. which is, again, going to affect, uh, you know, if it comes through, of course, if it gets passed, but will further affect, uh, you know, how good the results are going to be and it's just going to get harder so that's why you know i think the default of paid ads it's where i think it comes from uh, and i understand why we do it but i think we need to look for alternatives i agree totally and uh, all those things i've felt myself i've seen it with my clients the, the return on the paid ads has just gone down and down so yeah. what are those alternatives what should people be focusing on so there's a number of great alternatives. Uh, I'm a huge fan of content and SEO. Uh, the, the thing with content and SEO as opposed to paid ads, you know, one of the things I didn't talk about with paid ads is there's an immediacy to it. I mean, yes, you need to optimize over time, but you can set up an account, get approved, build an ad, and, and two or three days you can launch it. And, you know, two or three days after that, you can start optimizing. Uh, so it's really immediate if you need to, course correct or you need a boost uh, in leads towards the end of a quarter or some sort of reporting period, you know, you can do things like that. Uh, and SEO and content won't. You know, you're working on things today that will start really paying you back in six months or 12 months time. Uh, the beauty of it, though, is, is that when it starts to pay back, everything you do on top of it just stacks. So, you know, it might start small, but, you know, the work that you've done 12 months ago doesn't go away still there and then everything you do builds and builds so i love content and seo uh it just fouls the immediacy uh the other thing that i really like uh is referral marketing 
I think referral marketing is great, you know, uh, and I think it works for both consumer brands uh, and B2B. Uh, but for consumer brands, people trust their friends a lot more uh, than, you know, just another ad. People are starting to understand that influencers uh, are often just another paid channel as much as they talk about collaboration. Uh, but referral marketing, when your friend says, hey, I've got this great deal, you know, here, if you buy it as well, and, and you'll get, you know, 20% off, and I'll get 20% off, everybody wins. So referral marketing is awesome. It's very low cost. Uh, and the, but still has a problem with the media scene, uh, particularly for startups. You need an audience already. You need customers already uh, to refer you to new customers. And so if you're starting from zero, if you're still trying to go from zero to one, uh, you know, that's a struggle. So for me, that's more of a mid-stage tactic. Uh, and so naturally, you know, I'm going to uh, lead into partnerships. Uh, and I think partnerships are such a really powerful tool. I didn't start off working with brand partnerships. It was, uh, I was running global sales at another startup called Contour. It was one of the... Uh, uh, competitors with GoPro. Uh, we were mm. neck and neck for about five years until we weren't. It's a story for another, another chat. But, uh, there I learned, you know, we partnered very early on with Red Bull. Um, we were a small little brand, but we had things to offer. Uh, and Red Bull were already established back. We're talking 2008, 2009. And that's where I saw, you know, the lift that we got as a brand just by association. Uh, and then, you know, we also partnered with Burton, the snowboard company, K2, Ducati, uh, and all of these things. Every time we did something with them, we had this huge immediate boost in traffic. Uh, and, you know, just the, that brand halo effect where, you know, people looked at us and went, wow, you know, this contour company is a pretty serious player. Uh, and so that was my introduction. I worked with these brand partnerships, but I didn't close those deals. Uh, but it stuck with me. It was such a powerful tool. Uh, and, you know, I spent a lot of time wondering, uh, you know, why everybody didn't do it. Uh, and it was only later that I figured it out that, you know, it was very powerful, it can be, you know, low cost or zero cost. Uh, but there are a few challenges that needed to sort out, which was, you know, why I created Intribe to, to bridge that gap. It makes a lot of sense. So I, I love the idea of partnerships. I think they're super powerful and they have a higher close rate than other methods. Yeah. How would you recommend other software leaders who are just starting out like yourself? How would you advise them to go out and start creating some of these partnerships? What should they look for? How should they do it? So, you know, a lot of people are scared of partnerships. Some people have had bad experiences. Uh, and for me, uh, mostly that comes about if uh, somebody wants to get married straight away, you know, it's, uh, I often use the marriage analogy or, or the human dating analogy, but, you know, I would, I would start early. I would start small, uh, and I would date a little bit, uh, and, and make sure, you know, that I keep learning from everyone. So, mm. you know, it could be as simple as just, uh, uh, tweeting about another brand. Uh, you know, you could tweet and then post on LinkedIn and post on Facebook. Uh, that's always also a good way to, to find potential partners, but starting small and dating a little first. Uh, you know, I have an, let's say I have an email address of, of, uh, you know, a thousand, uh, sorry, I have a list of a thousand email addresses and, uh, you know, the potential partner has a list of, you know, 1200 email addresses, um, both targeting, say, environmentally conscious, um, you know, surf friendly, uh, women between 25 and 35. Uh, well, okay. Now, you know, we have exactly the same demographic that we sell to. We're not competitors. We can simply send an email blast. Uh, introducing one brand, introducing another brand is something that people are very familiar with. Uh, people still trust the brands they buy from and they see that process a lot. It's like when you're, um, booking uh, and, uh, flight. When you book a flight, you're often introduced to uh, a rental car brand uh, at the end of the purchase. Uh, you may be introduced to a cause partner to reduce your carbon footprint on the flight. Uh, these things, you know, these ideas of brands introducing other brands uh, is, you know, really basic in the psyche. So that'd be where I start. 
you know, own your list, build your list, uh, and then very low cost or, or you know, o- o- almost zero cost, uh, just, you know, an email swap. Uh, and that's a great starting point. So good. Uh, check out the brand, check out the product. Obviously, you want to make sure it's a quality product and, and you know, your, your ethical standards are the same. So a little bit of research to begin with, but then the execution uh, can actually be very cost effective uh, and then build from there. You know, try that with a few different brands, try a few different techniques, maybe host a joint webinar. Uh, then you can actually get three or four brands. Uh, and then you, you know, you're promoting your brand to the email list of three to four other brands. Uh, so partnership isn't just two companies together. You know, it can get, uh, you know, infinitely more powerful. I totally agree. I love how you can get, kind of make it go and go and go. And that's something that a lot of people don't use, that email swap. I think it's really mm-hmm. a powerful mechanism. I've used it in the past very successfully, and I just don't think enough people are using it, enough brands are using that. So this has been awesome, Sven. Super, super great stuff that you've been able to share. Sadly, we're out of time, but I want to make sure that people can learn more from you if they need to. So how shall our audience learn from you or reach out to you if needed? Fantastic. Uh- Look, this has been really awesome. Uh, that time went so fast. Uh, I think I was having so much fun talking with you. <laughs> but uh, to, to follow up uh, at Twitter, I mean, my Twitter uh, handle is uh, at Radovix. So my last name, which you can see on the screen, uh, probably something I should change, but it's just at Radovix. Uh, and then on LinkedIn, just, you know, search for Sven Radovix and, uh, you know, really keen to talk to anybody about startups or partnerships uh, at any time. Okay, perfect. We'll put all that into the show notes as well. So if you're listening, you'll be able to pull that up and see it. But Sven, thanks so much for coming on. This has been fantastic. Matt, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed myself. Uh, Me too. It's been awesome. And thank you everybody for coming. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Really appreciate having you here. Make sure that you are subscribed to the show so you don't miss any amazing insight from other great leaders like Sven. So once again, thank you for coming. We will see you next time. Take care. Great. Thanks, Matt. Bye, Sven.